<laughs> I had just uh, arrived in Hawaii and been transferred down to the shipyard dispensary in the middle of the Navy Yard. Down there in the shipyard, we take care of the civilians working in the Navy Yard. So on December 7, 1941, I'm on night duty in the dispensary and I got off duty about 6.30 in the morning and had to walk about 45, um, three quarters of a mile down to the main gate and go into the receiving station because everybody coming in or out of the Navy Yard had to go to the receiving station. The shipyard, the Pearl Harbor survivors that were hospital corpsmen, we all lived down in the civilian housing area. So I went into the matching arm to sign out, and I said, I'm going home. He said, okay. So when I came out, I looked over toward the battleship road, and I said, the planes were diving on the battle lines. And what tank is this? We don't train on Sunday. The guy gets up early and goes to chow or goes to church. But the rest of the guys don't get up till about 8 o'clock in the morning. Then I saw one of the planes turn up to the right with the rising sun on the fuse log and wings and my God, those are Japanese planes. So I ran over to the receiving station, took the fire axe, was breaking down the door of the armory to hand out the old three Springfield single shot weapon where you load and lock and fire and eject after the second round, the war is over. <laughs> we gave one to everybody that wanted one, and they were firing all the way from the main gate throughout the bow wagons on Battleship Road. It's quite a distance. So I don't think anybody ever hit anything because of the distance. Hospital Corpsmen did not get weapons in those days, so I came on down to and then Doc right there and was watching what was happening. Suddenly I heard a big noise to my rear. I looked back, but I couldn't see anything. Suddenly a bunch of aerial torpedo bombers, the gates came right over my shoulder, dropped off torpedoes about 10 foot off of the water. And they were heading all right out to Battleship Road. And I saw a bunch of them were heading toward the Oklahoma. So I ran down the dock 50 feet and caught a barge and we headed toward the Oklahoma. We never did get there. Nine torpedoes hit the Oklahoma and it turned over and sank in 12 minutes with 429 men aboard. Well, I had been studying to be a frogman. I had salvage duty training and I was a hospital corpsman, but I didn't get the underwater demolition portion. So I spent the next four hours there in the water picking up people. Some of them were dead already, of course. Some of them badly burned, some badly injured, and some were just tired because they got blown off the ship or, or jumped off and had to get ashore. Even some of the dead people, we just had to throw a line around their leg and haul them behind the boat because we had so little room to pick up the people. Well, after four hours, I'm really tired. So I run back to the, to the receiving station, told the master, no, I'm not going home. He said, oh, you can't go home. You're going to have a captain's pass for breaking in the armory. Captain's man for what? Aren't we supposed to protect ourselves? And then, yeah, but this is peacetime. Peacetime, you have to sign out your weapon and ammo. When you get all two, you sign them back in. Well, fortunately, President Roosevelt declared war the next day, so they called me in and I got an award for breaking into the armory and they gave me a part of a cigarette. But you had to qualify under Navy regulations first. Well, I'm still going home, but not the dog said, you can't go home. I'm going to put you on the main gate of the receiving station because you're a petty officer, second class pharmacist mate. So he gives me the old three spring room and I'm standing on the front gate. Said, nobody in or out that don't belong here. He says, okay. So I'm waiting. Suddenly the admiral from I think my fleet headquarters came down and with a medical admiral. I snapped to attention. He said, 
Well, Cato, what you doing here? And I said, I'm guarding the door, sir. Nobody in or out that don't belong here. And he said, yes, but Cato, pharmacists make don't have weapons. They have first aid packs. So he took me off the detail. He said, I'll give you another job later on. Well, later on, I didn't know when that would be. But in the meantime, the Arizona who had taken on this bomb from up there went down four deck and blew up in the ammunition locker with a giant explosion. And the Arizona burned for two and a half days right down to the deep wood deck. So he said, come back on Wednesday and said, okay, I'll Friday he said, you pick up ten men, go out to the Barry, go out to the Arizona, start removing the bodies. But I said, sir, I'm a farm boy from Illinois. I've never been aboard a battle wagon. He said, don't worry. He said, you'll find out as soon as you get out there. Okay. So I told the men, I said, I don't know what we're going to find. I'll tell you one thing. And I'm a hospital corpsman, and people who've been in the water that long from Sunday till Friday of the next week start to blow up and burst. We had a lot of fish in the water in those days, 24, 25 kind. Some more eels, even some tiger sharks. They'll start feeding on the bodies. And I said, about those men down there, I don't know if that's too far down. Our diving gear is for salvage diving outside the ship. We can't go down and find out about them. But I should imagine with the giant explosion, Everybody within 500 to 1,000 yards is probably just little pieces of flesh. Okay, Friday picked up the men, we headed out to the Arizona, got out there, the whole front end, of course, had been blowing off and was down in the water, but the rear end was still up, so we went aboard about the area of the quartermaster, and we went aboard. I think about the first thing I saw, there was some ashes going across the deck. I wonder what that is. I said, what happened? Ashes must be from a human body. I said, I can't stop it. I don't have a broom, no dustpan. <laughs> I just sort of sank down in my dungeon to shed a few tears. But suddenly I said, well, I have 10 men waiting for me to tell them what to do, so I sprang back in action. I said, okay, men, spread out on the ship wherever you find the body, bring it in, we'll put it in the sea bag, send it up to Red Hill for burial. So we got up there. I think we saw a bunch of helmet liners lying across the deck. And said, well, there's nobody around. I wonder what bank to them, but they opened up the hatch there. The body was down in the hatch. But he didn't have a head, so he figured that must be the one that lost the head. The ashes was blowing off the deck. So put him in the sea bag, send him up to Red Hill. A lot of the men behind the five inch 50 guns, of course, had burned right down to the deck. They were just little piles of ashes. But we couldn't tell who they were. They didn't seem to have any dog tags on them. I said, that's strange, because I know everybody had dog tags if, if they, when they went through training. But I guess they were made out of aluminum, so they were just burned down to something unrecognizable. We also found a bunch of men in the aft fire control tower who we went up the ladder and the fire caught them. They'd been reduced to charcoal about two feet tall, so we tried to spread them apart. We had to come off with an arm or a leg, and we just had to put whatever we could in the seat bag, send it up to Red Hill for burial. Well, I've been there about three weeks, and when I went back to the receiving station, Master Don said, you can't go out tomorrow, okay? You're going to have a summary court, Marshal. Marshal, what for? Well, he said, you're teaching a war diary. No, I did keep your notes every time I find a body. We put down all the circumstances, where and what time and how, everything connected. Perhaps that's the duty stage of one of the men. And later on, we can tell who it was. So I went to the court marshal and the commander.
companion said, where is your notes? and handed them in